do you have friends who tell you things like tell you things for like important things in life like for example how am i looking today do you think i should do something better today do you have friends like that in your life i do but i also do you listen to them yeah but i am that friend i think i'm more the friend and so like i always say like you've met my sister before shout out sarah an official third cast made of this podcast who i bring i mine her trauma for my views um she will ask me how she looks and dude i think she's a hot beautiful woman so i keep it 100 and i'm like no i think you should change this then she's mad at me so lately i've been doing this thing where i don't give my honest opinion i'm like if she has her outfit on and she's feeling good like i'm like great we're good then she'll come home and be like why the oh god i forgot you like why didn't you tell me yeah. that i look like you know i was hit by a bus of substitute teachers clothing from like the late 80s yeah. and then ran over again by like Madonna in the 70s. And I was like, because I didn't want to like get in the way of your artistic vision. And she was pissed. And she was like, don't ever do that again. You tell me when I'm ugly. And I was like, Done. So honest friends. Yeah. I met one of your honest friends. Oh. And I really liked her. Which one? She's on the pod today. Oh, I was like, which one of those liars convinced you that they're honest? She's I have on a the problem. Podcast. I always say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the podcast. Thank Alina. you, guys. Woo, thanks, thanks. Alina, not I'm me. I'm going to clap for myself. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> yes. For those of you who do not know, Alina Nakvi is an incredible fashion photographer, creative director, art. Sure, we can just say things. Visuals, I just like it. I'm not going to say no. At visual any storyteller. <laughs> you you have one million percent seen her work before. Hopefully. Um, one of her <laughs> greatest shoots was during the pandemic. Is it? Was, was it please, you? Uh, please, Ilhan. Uh, oh, was it you? One of her that's greatest, the greatest. This is one. so basically we're making this about Saba again. Yeah. That's one not of her shocking. greatest shoots <laughs> happened during the pandemic when they decided when Weekend Magazine decided to Saba, do I can't believe you're actually a cover story. <laughs> Why? It's our like genesis, isn't it? The dinosaur is. Okay, we'll get to the dinosaur. <laughs> But no, we had a, during the pandemic, she shot a digital cover story for me through an iPhone, which by the way, became a thing during that time. But you it were one of the thing. first who did it. it. I was the first person to copy the idea. But you were in Pakistan. <laughs> See, yeah. honest friends, I love yeah. it. Yeah, like, uh, Very cool. There was no shame in that. But I saw it, a bunch of designers who were going on FaceTime and like yeah. taking screenshots and then editing those screenshots. Wow. And so I was like, let's just try this because yeah. we couldn't move yeah. as much as I wanted to run out of the house every day. But this was the easiest way and Saba was my my first muse. <laughs> Honestly, it was one of my favorite shoots I've done Yeah, because it was one of the fun first times I got to work with a female photographer and it was just such a different experience and i'm not yeah. just saying that because trust me in this <laughs> point the way i'm enraged at the woman <laughs> sitting next to me i don't want to be nice to her i'm always mad at ilham but it's nice to divide up that anger at, Lucky least, you. <laughs> at least we can bond over yeah. it together so, today but it was an extremely unique experience huh. and mm. it made me like think about like how different work could be if female photographers and female this yeah. and female that wasn't such a whoa what a moment yeah <laughs> it's it, happening it's somehow still shocking i hate yeah. the fact that they put labels on everything yeah this female label on something that has been around for so long really done just, a time and 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 we tend to make it such a big deal even though it's i mean at the end of the day it's it's a career right it's a career how did you get into it career. it's funny i actually taught myself everything that I know when it comes to photography. Very I just cool. had this innate desire and this passion to create. I didn't know how. Um, I was a fine artist. I went to school for that and for business and psychology. But uh, well, by the time I came back to Pakistan, I just, I wanted to get into fashion. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why. And I don't know why I made any of the choices I particularly mm -hmm. made, but I have no clue. But I had these I was drawn to imagery and the way fashion would relate to like art and this uh, like right. what you live in every day and amalgamated in this very interesting way. And I started working for designers and brands and marketing departments like Zara Shah and, and brands like that. And whenever they're just brands like that, some of the most <laughs> iconic. <laughs> Yeah. Images, yeah. I think, around the world belong to Zara Shah Jahan and yeah. her campaigns. Incredible. Incredible. I love her artistry. I've always yeah. really enjoyed her campaigns. And, sorry, so, I didn't yeah. mean to cut you off. And I'm not saying 
that you know it's not Zara Shah Jahan. Of course, it's her talent. And everything yes, else. But it I'm is. A lot of those images. Yeah. Um, you you did take them. You guys have a beautiful relationship. It was a wonderful relationship. She was yeah. the first person to actually very much encourage me to pursue this line of work. Right. I would ex want to explain the idea that I would have for a campaign or we would discuss an idea and we would like relay that to whatever photographer was on set. But a lot of what was in my head was never translating to the images. So right. I just kind of started by picking up my iPhone and then there was a camera that was in house just not being used. So mm -hmm. I picked up the camera and I would annoy every single photographer I met constantly like what's this button and what does this do and oh, how cool. does this work that's very cool and they would just be like please go away <laughs> just, <laughs> just stop asking us so many questions and I just and now the same people are like we know her yeah. we we that was us yeah. we taught her what you, that yeah. button does there's some pissed male photographers <laughs> in a basement somewhere like that was my idea was actually my, you know some were really like actually not some very few were very welcoming. Right. Like I can two were very <laughs> welcoming. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> just two. And it was just I just wanted to know how to do it because I don't know why. I just felt like that is where I could communicate. And right. photography became my language. Wow. And that okay. was it. And that was so my So it was love. never something yeah. that when like as a kid you were like, this is something that I could get. It just happened. Oh no, it happened. It just happened. But that's the yeah. best kind of things. Like when they just it's the universe. I always say the universe has plans for us. Yeah. And and things just kind of fall into in front of you and it's 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 your choice to go pick them up and and work with them and in in this case you actually put in the work and and learn yeah i mean I, I i didn't know what i was getting into there wasn't much of an industry that existed for female photographers i think natasha zaber was the at that time was the only other female photographer that was working on a higher scale taking on commercial work trying yeah. to get break into that industry that was so male dominated right there's just no room they just gave you no room i mean they don't teach it either no, I ever. Mean, yeah. I, I took a course forever ago. I uh, there was a point in my life where I was like, "Hey, let's try this." I really, I met actually, I actually met a female photographer. Yeah. She didn't live here. She was Pakistani origin, mm. but uh, moved abroad, and she was doing all these shoots for Nat Geo and whatnot. Wow. I became fascinated, yeah. and I was like, "You know, you're such a cool person, and I want to try what you're doing." Yeah, got a camera, took a course. Mm. Learned the buttons. Yes, the buttons. The buttons. <laughs> they're, the they're really the, all of that. Uh, did it, and then my camera got stolen, and I. <laughs> oh uh, my god! <laughs> I'm so sorry. I didn't think I would go that route, right? Uh, camera got stolen. Never picked it up again. I was broken you hearted. Know, I've oh. had four digital cameras stolen. Let me tell you guys, guys, what do you do with your cameras? Suburban Maryland in the mid 2000s was a freaking wild west. And one day it was I had got. And by the way, if you remember digital cameras in those 2000s, the you so ones. much as tap that yeah, yeah. thing. And it was like broken. broken. Yeah, yeah. They're so delicate. I got They're delicate. And they were I remember I got one. I think it was like at that time, $200. Yeah. And now, by the way, they are like people hunt them down because they're like, oh, my God, I love the imagery. Vintage. And I'm like, vintage. Yeah, because yeah. we're vintage now. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I love it. So then um, I went to a, I went to like one of my first high school parties. Yeah. Sorry, parents. They don't know about this. I was so excited. And I had replaced my camera that day. And I sat down and my it like slid out the back of my jeans, my back pocket of my jeans because hot girls put things in their back pockets. I was going to say, that's not the yeah. place you put and a camera. And then um, but... never saw it again. It was that same. And my mom was like, you will never on my watch take a photo again. First, she was like, <laughs> never get a this. This I had to fight to get a phone like this. She was like, you are banned. It was so heartbreaking. And now when I see you, like, oh, my God, I found one for like $30 at like blah, blah, blah. I'm like, man. That was our life. That, that was, was that was us all the time in front of the, the mirror time. taking those awful flashy pictures. Yeah. But now it's blurry. a thing. Blurry. There are so like many blurry pictures. Now, yes. now yeah. it's a filter. Yeah. Now it's a filter. That, that it's blur a of the 90s yes. is, a, is a filter yeah. now. And I'm just like, this was my entire childhood. Blurry and ugly. <laughs> There's still a lot Bad of people's childhoods have got to say. <laughs> Bad haircuts. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think that's the funny thing is that all that is used being now as these... Uh, nostalgic images yeah. and it's a style and it's becoming a style yeah. like presets and filters and all these availability of things makes photography much easier and quicker but when you when I started it it wasn't it was that weird era with we were neither here nor there like it was it, things were digitized but they were still complicated cameras right. had not advanced to the extent that they've 
become now there are these things called mirrorless cameras that take care of everything for you they control mm -hmm. your light they control everything for you and you kind of just have to position yourself in the right way but when i was learning the only idea that i had is that if i learn everything from scratch then i will know exactly what i need to know one day so i was told to go into one of those like rooms where you develop your own pictures yeah. and stuff to, like go proper analog yeah and i was like oh, don't have time it's very for time this. consuming yeah it's very time consuming. but but yeah. but my but the the chap who was teaching me he was like that's the only way to do it. like you have to you'll fall in love with it even more yeah when you go that route where you start from so it's like when when they're telling you to learn how to drive a car they're like first change the tire then yeah. you learn how to drive a car i'm like yeah but i don't know how to change a tire I was neither do I. I was like, I <laughs> but i drive all the time <laughs> neither do i so I, was, I was told yeah. not that i did it i was told to do it yeah. not that i and now if i have a flat i just stand on the side and i'm like i'm a, I'm a girl <laughs> help <laughs> ladies me. yeah when when i need it i use it but i think um i think you touched on it and as did you is that when you really want to learn about something, like even going that nitty gritty would do it. Cause I'm the type, I'm like, if it's not easy for me, I'm like, I'm over it. Yeah. But I decided to take ceramics cause I'm in my thirties. So I decided to Makes go sense. to a clay class, this and that. Dude, right now you could talk to me about earth minerals, mud, any of that <laughs> stuff. Because when you fall in love with something yeah. and you see what you're able to create, it's amazing. Sorry, I am gonna bounce back. I'm saying this for editors cause I wanted to make a point on mm. something. It's interesting because look, Pakistani fashion is majority women's clothing. Very, I would say very especially female centric, yeah. When you look at our high fashion, you, bridal is our biggest thing. Yeah. Lawn, by the way, you might not know this. You would think it's bridal, but lawn it's is lawn. our biggest export yeah. to mm -hmm. the world. It is everywhere. Um and I find it interesting that we were talking earlier about women owning anger, which we'll get into, but yeah. it's also like we don't even own our image, right? Yeah. Because you don't put women behind the camera. Mm. Oftentimes you don't have women, you know, even where you would on think the makeup set, yeah. room on the set, you know, doing direction, doing lighting. Like yeah. the idea that a woman's image that is being projected, not just to Pakistan, but the world is being crafted by men is yeah. very interesting to me because it's it's like, shocking to me yeah. that, that that was the industry that I was entering into and yeah. like the conglomerates the textile conglomerates are all like these male run companies and yeah. everyone is so is dictating the imagery of women for women marketing it to them but the women are not involved in the process yeah. like there are certain designers like like we said Rizar, Shaja and all, a lot of female centric designers but the team was very Maybe. male centric yeah. like all the light guys the production guys everybody else a lot of the makeup artists also they're yeah. all men. men yeah and they're getting together in these rooms and trying to dictate how women should manipulate their bodies, look, the imagery, what you're kind of selling, the narrative, the story, everything. But that it, it doesn't make sense. There's because a disconnect there. Because it tr yeah. doesn't translate. Yeah. Just like when we talk about things when they're not authentic. Yeah. You can tell. People can pick up on it now. Mm. Uh, which is why there's so many uh, things that scripted things don't work on TV anymore. Like yeah. the proper scripted things. That's why they want more improv. The, similarly, yeah. if, if a man is doing something and they expect a woman to do it, if they're over directing a woman. There's something that we talked to Trinette about also. Yeah. She went hard on the fact that she has never felt more comfortable with a woman photographer and not because it's a woman but because she's not being over directed yeah a man does not know how a woman's body is going to react yeah in a certain situation that's what she kind of i think a big about. part of it also is just like because i am a woman the part that matters to me the most when I'm on a set and where I'm about to meet the models is the interaction that I have with them, that relationship, that intimacy that we're creating. Because when you're creating imagery, that relationship will translate onto the set. Absolutely. How you interact with those models, how they, and be it female or male, both. Right. I make an effort to try and get to know who's in front of my camera. And then once I understand that relationship, you have to trust that they're doing their job and you should be able to do your job but I've seen on a lot of sets some male photographers will just bark orders at how they should right. be contorting their bodies into different ways that don't seem particularly natural and they're not coming out or yeah. they're obsessed with the idea of female perfection right so they're contorting these bodies in the ways that highlights every aspect of that woman in its utmost perfection and they lose the idea that there's a lot of beauty in the imperfection in the in the strange in the unknown and 
that's I think it's a rep, it's a narrative on how men generally look at women is that they have this expectation of utter perfection and that there's no room for anything else if she's not a beautiful doll who's skinny and attractive with fair and light eyes and poised and relaxed but yeah women are far more complex than that we have far more going Absolutely. And then all of that gets ignored and our imagery gets stagnant and stuck in one place that is performative. Right. And then men actually expect that when you're off that stage, when you're off that set, you should be per- performing the way you performed on that set. Be perfect, be soft, be gentle all the time, smile. It's it's ridiculous. And yeah. photography is just it's a a play on reality. Right. So if you're going to constantly tell people and perpetuate this narrative that this is reality, this is how women should be, mm-hmm. it will translate into our society and our culture and everything else where they expect you to be that way all the time. Um sorry, first yeah. I'm smirking. I don't I won't repeat the story. I do highly recommend you guys check out Trinette's episode if you yeah. haven't as yeah. well. Those are great um, episodes. But I told a story in that as well where yeah. I was like, you know, working with a male photographer who clearly did not like dealing with my body did not mm. like dealing with that didn't even understand why a model like me was there yeah um and i've compared it to my moments with female photographers and extremely different like where yeah. you know i was almost made to feel ashamed for performing femininity yeah. in this body in front of a male photographer yeah. as opposed to i specifically recall you being like well she says this in real life to me too but she was like just relax and like do <laughs> and like do what you want to do because in front of a male photographer now it's happened twice with a different photographer actually yeah. I'm not gonna lie I was on a shoot a few weeks ago a few weeks two months yeah. I called her like upset yeah, and I and really I was upset. actually gonna quit modeling and then the very next day I happened to, not next day next shoot I happened to be on a set that it was majority women again yeah. like the whole team was women and I calmed down and I was like okay I'll let my my career continue so is it but. is it also because you're more com- generally you have your guard down because there's a woman there or because there's majority women there you automatically have your guard down as opposed to you walk into a room like this where you have men and women or more men than women and yeah. then you just you kind of have your guard like for a model right okay. would it would that i mean is that that has to be something there so so i won't i actually don't for me personally i don't think that's the case only because as you know you and i worked together for many years like we are in an industry where there's lots of men like i was yeah. in news for a long time so it, you are almost one in you know four yeah. women in a room at any given time i think that energy is immediately felt cuz like i recently did a bigger lawn brand and i've worked with them before but yeah. this time you know i walked in it was a lot of men on set but like we were laughing we were having a good time there was no over direction i there agree was no thoughts, it is, you know it's the person it, it's that energy kind yeah. of like so when yeah when the person crafting the image and yeah. running the set because a photographer really is the person yeah. running that set um they, they create that environment for you to yeah. either feel comfortable or not comfortable and that it translates yeah. like you'll feel it if the photographer male or female is interested in creating a softer environment where everyone is collaborating mm-hmm. then you feel it but if they're there to dictate you'll also feel it that right. dictation creates a barrier between everybody when you're just told what to do rather than asked and have a conversation back and forth right. that's what makes like in my experience yeah. that's what makes the difference you can't dictate photography is not a standalone career it takes a million different people to craft that particular image right. and everyone needs to be in sync and collaborating with one another and not taking the credit for creating everything themselves and that's where ego comes into play and unfortunately yes men just have a tougher time with their ego than women do in my opinion but yeah Yeah, because we've been having ego death since the day we were born, and they were like, "Damn it, <laughs> it's you, like, again." <laughs> so, so, like you said, that there's there's a lot more that goes in. It's not just you doing yeah. a solo job, yeah. even though it's you and your camera. But there's all these other parts to it. Absolutely. That said, clients is a big part. also right yeah. they're the ones who also will dictate they're also the ones who will come and and tell you no i want it done this way i want it yeah. have you had issues have you had i wouldn't say the word issues have have you had obstacles have you had things that you've had to manipulate and maneuver and situations that you've had to kind of go around to get your creative vi- like v- vision out there i think after 
however many years I've been doing this now, I've learned when to say what. Right. You know, that's and the that comes biggest, from experience. Yeah, that's just experience because when I was new, I would. I'm passionate, so it comes off as argumentative very easily, and that line because I'm a woman who's passionate, then yeah. it's seen in a whole other Even different more, yeah. light. Yeah. Whoa! And yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so like it, to say. it gets very frustrating when I feel like that brand could elevate its process a little bit by listening to what I would like to put into it. But then it really depends on who's on the other side of the table. Right. They have to be interested in what I'm saying in order for it to get anywhere. And if they're not interested, I have to take a step back and do the job. Because sometimes the job is just the job. Yeah. You have to take the picture. You have to do what you have to do. We love to say that we're all creatives and this and that. But we all have bills to pay at the end of the day. And the reality is that we have to sacrifice a lot of ourselves in order to get to where we need Hit to get. Right here. Yeah. Like, like we can all relate to this. Yeah, like I, honestly. I live on my own. I have to pay rent. I don't have have the luxury of always putting in my ego and saying that you know I feel like this could be done better and I have a better art direction for this or so let's hire this person right no you have to step aside and yeah. you have to deal with the fact that this industry it doesn't come with a lot of rules and regulations it's yeah. open ended we are all freelancers we all give our time based off of whatever we're trying to manage on our phones mm -hmm. i don't have a lawyer or a team present to take my stand when something goes wrong there are no professional ethics that really exist over here brands will take advantage of you it's in any amazing. second it's amazing we've I, been around yeah. since 1947 and we still have industries and like almost every yeah. second guess that comes on we talk about their industry and we're like yeah it's still you know early days early day i'm it's, like it's how? 2024 it can't be early days how anymore is it early days? <laughs> why have we not gotten this down as yet i don't know and it's that mentality i feel where the money buys you authority somehow so right. if they're paying you for the job you're doing the job you're yeah. doing everything that you need to do but because they feel that they paid you to do it you have to act the way they want you to act right and that's it it's strange that that power buys them that ability to say whatever they want treat you in whatever way they want when you say okay these this these are my terms and conditions i've had clients who have actually said to me well i didn't bother reading your terms and conditions wow so that seems like a you problem not a me problem <laughs> and i'm standing and i'm looking at them and i'm like what do you mean <laughs> like, just, just like keep keep it in keep i it do in, think it in. when we try to push to be a bit more on the professional side ourselves because we're told you yeah. you know what people love telling the oppress <laughs> uh fix it yourself and then you tell you tell us what not that i'm calling creatives oppressed but yeah um there's uh actually i'm sure you guys creatives must have oppressed. seen um an incredible illustrator and he's a comic writer named mm. omer najib khan yes yes he just posted on social media where he was like you know like i have had it with people not paying me and like we need to make like a creatives union Oof. in a sense and just that morning, I had cleared a two and a half month old payment yeah. that was not coming, not coming. And I was asking every single day. And I was like, and I've said this a few times, that it's incredibly degrading. It's you humiliating know, it's to humiliating. run after money you've earned. Yeah. It's humiliating. And to be treated like they're you're doing you a favor. in the yeah. wrong because yes. you asked. And so I've done this thing because obviously we have we have we share a mutual best friend also so like there's three of us uh but we she is very good with like our third mehex yeah. stylist shout out she's very good with like hey this is like one way you can do things i find that she's been very helpful to me yeah. so she gave me like a script and everything that i've ran through a couple times and sometimes the clients love it because they're like great yeah it's all there and sometimes they're like oh excuse me someone's getting a little big for their boots <laughs> yeah it's just it's it's funny that they it's like your payment process shouldn't be dependent on the company's policies because that's their internal working. Yeah. And somehow we as creatives or freelancers have been made to believe that we have to work according to their systems. Yeah. But we are our own entity and bring our own terms and conditions to the table. So if I say give me a 50 percent advance, they're like, excuse you. They're like, where are you running off to where, with this what, money? What Oscar winner do you think you are? And yeah. I'm just like, I just would like to know I'm going to pay it at the like, end of the day. Send a picture of that Sitara and Theos on your desk, loser. I'm like, got yes. it. 
got it. Cool, my guy. <laughs> you know, to call them and be like, can you just give me the money? Because yeah. and then to beg for it in yeah. ways and be I like, I to have explain, to do it I to explain yeah. why I need to use that particular paycheck. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> I literally did that. I was like, just so you're aware, July first. <laughs> if I don't, yes. if I don't direct deposit this money, I will not have shelter. So if yeah. you could just kindly. Yeah. And the other thing I find that is part of their policy that they don't say out loud is hoping we forget. Oh, 100%. Genuinely, they hope we will simply They forget. give you so many loopholes. Like yeah. the accountant, but the accountant will shut his phone. And then the accountant yeah. has an assistant, but the assistant doesn't want to pick up because it's a Sunday that day. Yeah. And every every time you try and they're get like, somewhere. They're like the guy with the cash box key. He's actually in the north right now because his mom. And he left the key in the south. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The key solidly in Punjab. So we need to find. And I'm like, we? I'm not a part of this. Unbelievable. And, uh, Unbelievable. It's just, I think... I find it even harder as women to get that paycheck. Everything comes down to the gender, but we are, yeah. nothing has changed. Like, nothing I wish changed. I could say that, like, yes, we have the systems in place where, like, we're treated as equals and my male colleagues get paid the same amount that I do. No, none of that is true. Yeah. Everything is still harder. Do the lighting assistants or whatever else or production on set look at my face as though they're waiting or hoping that I'm going to fail and not know what I'm going to do? Absolutely, every single time. But I know my job. I know how to direct, but I've had to develop this alter ego mm -hmm. on set which is a firm dominant personality and would i like to sit down and have fun on set like everybody else and joke and laugh absolutely but do i get that leisure no and then when i am dominant and when i am assertive it's portrayed as this difficult villain over here who's yeah. so loud and so stern and oh my god i'm relating so hard it's yeah. it's ridiculous because had my male colleague assertively told the production guys or the light guys, they wouldn't even have yeah, blinked twice. Yeah, don't do this, this yeah. one. They wouldn't have even cared. They'd be like, yes, boss, we will fix Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But then when it's a girl, it's like, I'm hyper -odian. No, and then we get told on. <laughs> we get yeah. told on. Here's my thing. Like, look, I understand there's many conversations around this, but I keep hearing about men's emotions. <laughs> men's not being able to express emotion. I, I, in my five and a half years at this radio station, where, by the way, I'm the host of a show, right? Yeah. So by all means, like, I could be little Miss Diva coming in, throwing my... <laughs> I don't do you that. Wish, and yeah. actually, I will say, <laughs> She's like, you my wish. producer, my boss, yeah. whose name will not be said, has told me many times, like, girl, you got to, like, get in there and, like, be assertive. Like, yeah. don't let people... We'll just I think I finally did it. Like, and it wasn't even that harsh. I was just like, I'm not cool with this. I don't want to have to do this again. Like, you yeah. should know by now. The way I was immediately told on, like, they tell on you. Immediately. Oh, no, they do. Not di it's different. Not with our guys. Fine, with sorry. Our, I love you guys so much. Us? But I mean, no, no, I it's have been told on but at yes, work before. Yes, that, that happens. Yeah. That happens. And yeah. also, they, they chalk it down to, oh, you're... Oh, you're just having mood swings. Yeah. Or it's you're just having a bad day. Yeah. Or or human like female emotions or whatever. But apparently frustration is permissible for men, but not, but not for, for women. women. Yeah. And women aren't allowed to be to have emotions. Podcast of the characters from Grey's Anatomy, Ellen Pompeo and who's the other one? Catherine Heigl yeah. or something? Yeah. yeah. So they're talking about like how the perception of women really still till date is like victim or villain. Well, yeah, yeah. And Catherine, we're not permitted to be either, like, you can only fit in those two boxes. Yeah. You're assertive, you're dominant, you try and get your job done, you try and make sure that everything is done the way you want. Because, to be honest, it does come down to the photographer in the picture and it's my responsibility. If it's, yeah. if it's not good, then it will come on me. So if I'm doing what I need to, I'm the villain because I'm assertive and I'm aggressive and I'm not smiling at everybody and I'm not being a caretaker or soft or anything that's like feminine related. You're not worried about yes. being the most liked person Yes, on because set. it doesn't matter. Yeah. Or you're a victim because mm -hmm. it's easier to accept women in these two particular roles because after all these years, that's all we can identify with. But we apparently are not allowed any of the complexities of any other human emotions. Yeah. If I'm frustrated because something isn't happening, I can't just say I'm frustrated. It has to be hyper or something. These gender terms and words that are used for us on a daily basis. And we can't even react to those words. So it's just, what do you do with this build up constant frustration that reaches a point you where you're going to... Yeah. actually explode, explode yeah. yeah this is one of the things why like in many ways i do find it frustrating when it's like oh female 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 but unfortunately yeah. we are still in this yeah phase phase era endless endless hellscape yeah that 
our gender is constantly tossed in our face. Yeah. So when we toss back that this isn't cool, that oh women's card. Oh, oh my god, yes. Card. Yeah, but you oh. know what? We own it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at least we own it. Yeah. yeah. Where at the end of the day, anymore. if yeah. we walk in and if 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 they're scared of us or if they're saying, oh, you know, she's come the authority with <laughs> blah blah blah, boss lady is <laughs> here or whatever. Card in each and I'm like, yeah, female card. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, you know what? Yes, I have arrived, yeah. and as long as it gets the work done. Yeah. I I don't I don't owe you any explanation. Yeah. The thing is you neither of you are being unreasonable like Ilham runs a freaking ship. You know what yeah. I mean? You're running a ship each time yeah. you're on set. So it's like no one in here is asking you to clap and dance over fire. Yes. We're asking you to put the light where we told you yeah. to put it. Literally. As you've both had lighting yes. issues recently. Oh. And we're like, what the had hell? Had a lot of, yeah. yeah so that's know? the other thing. Uh, I, when we started this podcast, for me, this was like an out of body experience. Mm. I was never okay with being in front of the camera. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> Pre- much preferred being behind it <laughs> and uh for 10 years i pushed back and said no no i can't i can't do this i can't do this yeah. and then one day it just happened so that our one producer day. conned us into doing this <laughs> and i we did a demo and it turned out okay and then after that we did a couple of episodes and but to date i have imposter syndrome i'm, I'm sitting here talking to you i, I get it but it's, it's very difficult to translate that and i think a big part of it is also like the standard of beauty that we keep perpetuating in this industry. And I don't feel that I meet that standard of beauty because no, every I, time I'm on a shoot, you know, I have these beautiful, phenomenal women or what are, and they're skinny and they're tall and they have lovely hair and these features and everything is so perfect. Yeah. And by any standard, if I'm looking at myself in comparison, I don't feel like I fit that bill. And I, as much as I fight it and I'm I'm such a feminist and I believe in all these things, but I take it home then every day because then I'm working on those images and I'm seeing them over and over and over again that this is the standard of beauty. Mm-hmm. And so I've removed myself, a lot of myself, even from my own social media. Like my social media is dedicated primarily to my work because a part of me genuinely doesn't feel comfortable showing myself because I don't know where I fit in that standard. And then right. I feel this strange guilt that Am I also a part of this system where I'm saying that this is what beautiful is and we can only look like this and be perceived like this? And there's that disconnect. And it's it's very hard to for me to even come on camera or to be in front of the camera or to be anywhere where I'm having to like represent that because it's it feels strange. It right. feels foreign and alien. Like I I'm hyper aware that there are two cameras staring at me right now and I'm not sure how I look. And I don't look at them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm trying not to. I look to, right like, at <laughs> you. And Is that something and you I relate ignore. with too? A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent. So, the, so, I mean, she was talking about it through her perspective. Yeah. For me, I'm in, in a, uh, my job isn't, I'm not looking at beautiful people constantly. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I I'm in, a weekend show. I, I mean, work in radio. I'm reaction. listening to voices yeah. constantly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I sometimes say things just to trigger her. I love doing yeah. that. <laughs> it's the best. It's the, it's so easy. It, it's oh man, pressing a button. And uh, it's the way I just have fun. But <laughs> but I do end up meeting really amazing people and I'm constantly that's where my imposter syndrome also comes from where I'm constantly like I can never do what they're doing. I can never be that good. So I might as well just hide behind and highlight them and never highlight myself. Yeah. Mm. So that's that's something that like I struggle with and I've been told re- very recently also that you you might not see yourself because you're not putting a mirror there and seeing yourself, yeah. but you are good enough and you are, you know, just as good as all those other people and I'm like no, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I mean, I yeah. obviously think you're fantastic or we wouldn't be doing this. I agree. Um <laughs> and the feedback really has been as such. And honestly, like I'm a huge personality. Like I don't give a shit. I come in, I'm the very opposite to them because obviously I'm one of the first plus size models in the country. Yes. I'm not light skin. I don't my hair literally is naturally like this. Like I'm <laughs> the opposite of what a beautiful Pakistani is considered. Yeah. And I'm loud as hell, which you know, they hate loud. Three loud women right three here. loud Round women of applause for us truly um and so no i do want to say that to my my ode to oh, you're so comfortable when i give you love that yeah. you're fantastic at this <laughs> but cringing. the two things i wanted to build off your points well one is the thing um yes that in pakistani imagery a lot there yeah. is this idea of like like gazelle 
beauties that mm -hmm. are like very slim and fair skin. And we're talking colored contacts, if not naturally colored yeah. eyes and things along those lines. And actually my dad went, because when we were watching TV together and he, whenever a commercial comes on, he's like, this just doesn't, he's like, it's, they're beautiful, but like, this is, is this what the average Pakistani is supposed to look yeah. like? And I understand putting imagery out there that's like aspirational or this and that, but it just leads too far deep into colonial beauty standards, which are like, not indigenous Pakistani, yes. except a very small minority who, by the way, never get that camera put on them. They are yeah. like a race. However, I do want to give some props mm. over this way. You have you work with Rasta, which is one mm. of our biggest exports to the world. Very yeah. cool. Right. You have a beautiful relationship with Rasta, Zayn, Zlatia, yeah. yeah, and Mehek is also styled with them yeah. quite quite a bit. You some of the most st striking images are the fact that you're pulling people from I feel like all over the country, very yeah. different looks, skin tones, beauty standards that are being like, uh, you know, not that they're not being met. These are stunning people. But I'm yes. saying that's kind of the magic of it. Is but the like, range is far the more the range. Time. There's the right. That's yeah, it. it's so a lot more. What are, like, tell us a bit about the process of those type of shoots. You also have Misha Japanwala and you did yeah, that an was my incredible favorite shoot. shoot. Yeah. yeah, so I know I'm bringing in two things, but go no, for but it. That's, I, I, this it. is from, I love hearing yeah. about yeah. how you get down to it. I mean, yes. so I, for, I'll talk about the Rasta one first. So Zen and I've worked together quite a lot. Um, and he really just gave me a chance by bringing me on board and wanting me to be a part of his incredible imagery. What I love about Zen is that like, he will give you the narrative to the shoot. The campaign will have a story. It will have emotions. It will have like meat to it. There's an ideology behind it. If he's trying to pick up, like there's a shoot that we did where the background is all these velvet, like deep red curtains and everyone is in these like Raj colonial outfits. Mm -hmm. But the earth is Pakistani land. So it was like this. It's like commentary. grounding. Yeah, yeah it's this commentary cool. on like what it was like to be colonized and the amalgamation of these two different cultures and making sure that our land still remained the same way, even if the backdrop was beautiful and red and velvet. But like the art director, Moe Sirmizi, who's phenomenal, had this idea of like putting this imagery down where we were tying two things together. And what I love is that everyone is a part of that collaborative process. Like, it, yeah, I may have taken that picture, but I took that picture because every single person on that set was willing to put in their effort all together to tell that story. Yeah. Yeah. So if Mehek was styling it and she was tying into the cues that Zan were giving, so was the art director, so was everybody else. And he opens up his casting of models like to his village, anyone, everyone. It doesn't matter. It's like if you fit the role of beauty in a usual way, it doesn't have to be standardized beauty. He's looking to have everybody come from different places because that is what Pakistan is. It's yeah. the amalgamation of all these different places and you want that representation to come through. And so when we get on set, it's a... It's a great feeling and this energy that we're all shared and we don't care if 20 hours have passed and we're still shooting or it's it's difficult or we're dying or any of those things because we are really believing in the emotion that we're trying to get out. For me, emotion is everything when it comes to a photograph. Right. If that picture that you're looking at that I took doesn't elicit an emotion that I feel like I haven't done my job. Fantastic. Because I have to communicate with that those mm -hmm. people. The same way with like Misha, she is a phenomenal artist. Like she's taken Pakistan art on a in global scale. Her work speaks for itself. So she had this phenomenal exhibition that was talked about Begherati and a word that we all have heard so much, Begherat. And like when we say up with it, yeah. talked about, we're talking like all on every corner of this planet. Yeah, since, yeah. The, since the minute we are born as women, we are made to feel hyper aware of our bodies. Mm -hmm. And then we're made to feel the shame that our bodies carry because we can't display our bodies in the way God created them, but we have to hide it and dhako. Yep. And we start with dubattas when we're young and like cap sleeves, long sleeves. Somehow those three inches give you a lot of dignity. I don't know how, but like it gave you <laughs> Girl, all the dignity. I don't know what yours three world. inches, yeah. mine was one inch. <laughs> one inch and that, extremely yes, unflattering. And that was like, you know, that that was the, the defining factor between I, like, sleeveless and cap sleeves. One like, of my big tweets was that once is I was yeah. like, cap inch, the one inch difference between like Madonna and whore, basically. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that's what it was. So yeah. she was talking about like and like that feeling that we're always having to like 
ch- hide our bodies. Yeah. Like you can't go to Liberty or go down the street and mm-hmm. like just go in a normal shower kameez or jeans and a t-shirt. Yeah. Like you're always aware. So trying to and you feel shame. Yeah. Like if your blouse dips down a little too much and your cleavage comes in, you feel the shame. Yeah. If men are looking at you. You feel the shame. Like we're, we're you violated. With, yeah. World order. Yes. Honestly, like yes. you have violated like you did something, other people's yeah, awful. peace and shame, essentially. And we live with that shame. And she wanted, she and I had been talking on Instagram. We got to know each other. It was great. It was like this organic process. And she wanted to talk about how to translate that, that these beautiful body mold casts that she was creating into imagery and kind of have photography as the third layer to this entire exhibition. Very so it cool. was the sculptures themselves, the photography, and then like the narrative that it goes with. And we took a really big risk. We did it in Karachi. We did it on this beach. I don't know which beach it was because I'm not very familiar with it, but near French beach, as, as far as I know. We didn't really have permission to shoot there, but kind of like, uh. you know, wing it. <laughs> and yeah. we just went there and these great artists like Sherazad Janejo and mm-hmm. everyone else who had been, who the body molds had been previously like made on them. Right. Volunteered to like actually be the physical sculptures at that time. So we were putting two and two together. Now these women who are coming on the set, they're just wearing these breastplates and like, you know, whatever yeah. cloth draping we have going on underneath. And they're standing on the beach of Karachi and proudly owning their bodies. And it was a very powerful moment like That's everything amazing. that we were doing we wanted texture of the actual earth that we're dealing with the bodies to kind of m- like melt together with everything it was everything that came out of that image was all around the emotion that we were all sharing in this communal experience like there were when i take pictures another part of my mind is working one mm-hmm. that i'm not really aware of it's somewhere in the back and it's telling me this is how it would like to happen. Right. The light is coming from me. Let's try this. But then it's not going on in the frontal cortex of yeah. my mind. It's so strange. But there's a disconnect that where I see it and then somehow it goes. <laughs> 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 it like comes out. Right. And that's where the emotion lies. And for me, that's why I love photography. It's uh, the emotion. Don't you just love it when it all comes together? Oh my God. It's, oh, the it's feeling such a great that feeling. you get. Yeah. When it when you've worked on it, you've blood, sweat, and tears. You've spent twenty twenty hours yeah. on it, and then when it all comes together, and then you see it, it's just it's a whole other feeling. When that shoot came out and it blew up the way it did, I mean, she got featured in the New York Times, the Guardian, Harper's Bazaar, Vogue, all these things. Yeah, to see my name there, I thought I was gonna pass out. <laughs> like I couldn't breathe. I was like, what? It was. It was a surreal experience. You know experience. what was amazing when it was on Hype Beast. <laughs> yes. See, all, like, see, Alina and all of us, we are big sneakerheads in Huge. our thing. <laughs> and when it was on Hype Beast, I think me, Mac, oh my God, it's on Hype Beast. We were so excited. It was, it was exciting to be like a part of this yeah. and be, and yeah, to be a woman a part of this and take Pakistan on this international level Absolutely. where like you're giving so much, I don't know, attention and, my hope and my hope always is, is that if one girl out there sees it, one girl who doesn't have experience, who didn't go to school for this, who doesn't have this whatever background, believes that if I could do that, she could do it. Man, I that really the hope idea. there's more than one girl watching yeah. this and listening to this because this is legit like yeah. success story right <laughs> here. Mashallah, it's amazing. Mashallah. It's awesome. <laughs> I have goosebumps from this yeah. story. It was like feeling feelings. I yeah, know. It's, honestly. It's, awesome. like, it's it's the emotion. And I mean, I'm also really lucky. My family have just been incredibly supportive. And right. when my career started taking off, I was going through a lot of difficult personal stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I was getting divorced and I was trying to figure out like, is it possible for a woman to live on her own in uh, in a space and earn and live and whatever else? And there was so much pressure because we haven't created or modeled that lifestyle for women that you don't actually have to go from your parents home to your husband's home that there is a nice middle ground where you get to exist as a woman and experience life that way and work will give you that uh, questions like beta if you do go live on your own how are you going to survive and especially with a job like photography that you're 
I'm sure there's some badas in the family that are like, beta, like where will you earn from? Like go and get a job that's going to constantly keep giving you money and you just like a I'm secure. I'm lucky my family didn't do that. <laughs> you, you're <laughs> lucky. But I'm so lucky. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I acknowledge but that privilege. Are. I acknowledge that privilege. Right. Because right. yeah. like there are families household. out there yeah. that would, yeah. that, that's there their biggest fear, right? Yeah. Because like, how are you going to do this? Survive without a man. Thought, yeah, 10 years ago that like, photography as a woman is a career that could actually give you so much stability yeah. to put the ground underneath your feet. Amazing. No one thought that. And Amazing. now I hope that that's something my baby, everyone... My <laughs> I'm just so proud of her. I, I need to quit my job and go back to photography. <laughs> I, I, I don't have any ground under no, my like, feet. Even now, my dad will be like, you know, you're never too old for med school. And I'm like, you're right, you're right. They have been very Oh my supportive. God, Surgeon yeah. Sabah would be amazing. On it. <laughs> my dad's about to see that and be like, even she said. Even she said. Um... I don't know. I, I don't want to. There was a question I wanted to ask, but then we'd be going back. So I think we're going to. Well, you can ask it. We can maybe we back. can edit yeah. it in. I did want to ask um, how you, f I guess we kind of covered it, how yeah. you feel about how Pakistani women are portrayed, like in photography. And yeah, I, it depends. Like if you're talking about as photographers or as like Pakistani women in the imagery that photographers perpetuate. So like we, as, did, we yeah, went over the, the imagery. imagery. Yeah, we the, went imagery, over the, imagery the imagery thing. is just it's. It's exciting sometimes and it's not exciting at the same time. Everything is like, like in life, there's no right, wrong. There's no black, white. There's like a whole range of gray that exists Are in you the middle. Seeing Wait, did you push towards, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, yeah. I, I just want to say, when did you start this career? Like how long ago was it? Well, not that long ago. So when I joined Zara Shaja, it was about 2016. And okay. then when I, I think I may be wrong, but like somewhere around 2009, right before COVID hit. So the end of 2019, I uh, I started thinking, okay, and she really pushed me that like this is something you can do right. completely full time on your yeah. own. I had no right. idea what that meant, but COVID hit very hard right after that. As soon as I just started getting a couple of jobs, I'd gone to Zanzibar for a shoot, and we were I was trying just about to get into it, and then COVID, yeah, COVID yeah. hit, and yeah. it was really difficult to try and get back. So it's it's been a couple of years and stuff, but yes. do you think things have changed? I Over think, time, you know, the fact that there are so many other female photographers is the biggest change for me. Right. The fact that we have Sajal and Tuba and all these girls and Aiza and whatnot, <laughs> like it's amazing to see them. That's and awesome. I feel like what I love about the females in the industry is that we're all really like rooting for each other and we're all like hooting for one another. And I have never felt competitive with them. Right. I feel inspired by them. I mm -hmm. hope they're inspired by me. I well, really genuinely do. I was going to say, but there like, was a major moment for female photographers <laughs> just a year ago, right? It was a year yeah, ago. Yeah, last year. It was last, last year. Last year, the first female ever to win Best Fashion <laughs> Photographer of the Year at Hum Style Awards was none other than Miss Alina Nagli Lux. right here. Oh, Lux. 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 It was Lux. It's okay. So yeah. sorry. Lux. I don't know if It's an award. It it yeah. It's an award. It's an award. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's an award. And yeah. honestly... First of hopefully many. Yeah, we yes, saw the so internet cool. freaking erupt. <laughs> and um, so many people were so, so excited yeah. for you. And in your speech, you said you acknowledged it right up the top. You were like... <laughs> Thank you, but me being the first is indicative of you and not me. <laughs> no, she was like, and I hopefully will not be the, be last. the last. And I don't yeah. think, I think you will not be the last for sure. Yeah, I, 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 I hope that that yeah. was like the turning point. The yeah. fact that we had to get, take 22 years to get there is sad. I, I wish I wasn't the first, but I am utterly grateful to be the first. And I hope that's just like the benchmark of this is where it's going to change. Right. And this is where the lobbies and everyone else who's a part of creating or giving these awards or creating this industry or like managing it sees that like you have to give weightage to the incomparable female talent that exists. Right. And th that they deserve the limelight now. They deserve their time in the sun because their work has always been just as good, if not better. And I hope that that, you know, winning that award got that. Plus, I got to wear a beautiful dress. It was <laughs> by, really uh, nice yeah. by Suffuse, by Sana, who was a phenomenal designer. Yeah. I, I love shooting for her. But like, it felt great to also be like, that strong woman in that moment to be loud and tell women to be loud that it's a good thing 
to be relentless, to be fearless, to be as loud as you possibly can because we're always told to make ourselves a little bit smaller. I think people, a lot of people lose out on why award shows are there. They're there yeah. for this purpose. They're, yeah. they're there as a platform so that you guys get a voice to come out and say what you have yeah. to say, right? Uh, people are just like, oh yeah, award show, there'll be some dances, there'll be some people in gowns, we watch the red carpet and that's about it. But they forget that that yeah. it's actually shining a light on people who they should have been shining a light on for yeah. a very long time because yeah. there have been so many more yeah. uh, before, after, yeah. in between that they forgot about or never even thought to uh, ignore. Yeah. So, so I'm so glad that this happens. Yeah, so the award cool. shows definitely give that. They they give you that recognition because we don't have anything else, right? We're just doing our job every yeah. single day. We're performing to the best of our abilities. And those award shows give you the drive to know that like your work is being seen, right. you're being seen, yeah. it's real. Right. Like this is happening, we're getting there, it's changing and it just gives you that drive. And after a very difficult like personal time, that was just a really, it was a really great way to end the year. Awesome. It was a great way to end the awesome. year. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to end this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Get out of my studio, no. You have to drop um, me home. <laughs> <laughs> Alina, thank you so, so much oh, for thank joining you guys. Us. It was lovely. And I feel like you and yeah. I are like very similar. Yeah, we should, I felt it. I felt we the gotta, bonding, Yeah, yes. we totally got to hang out after this. this 100%. We, we, Saba's not going to yeah. like it, but She's gonna hate us. She's I gonna literally hair. was just <laughs> yeah. going to say I'm so happy my worlds are coming together. Zabai. But I guess they're <laughs> undeserving, ugly rats. I deserve that. Anyways, thank you again. Thank you thank so much. Thank you guys. Thank and you. where can everyone find you? Uh, at S Nakvi on Instagram, which is my favorite thing to say. Yeah. So if you my seen, name is not Sana, it is Alina. If you've seen <laughs> Snackvi, that's who it is. It all comes together. Okay, bye. Yeah. Right. Thanks, bye. <laughs> Thank you.